Love is in the air. Valentine's Day, just around the corner. Quickly, get your berries, get your chocolate, get your snug, snuggly pajamas, get the last second gifts. It's almost here, Valentine's Day. Americans make a really, really big deal about Valentine's Day. According to the uh, Greeting Card Association of America, people will send on Valentine's Day 150 million greeting cards. Second most busy day for greeting cards after Christmas. According to the National Feder Retail Federation, the average man is spending roughly $170 on clothing, gifts, jewelry, Valentine's Day. Bringing the total spending that Americans spend on this one day, February 14th, to roughly $20 billion on gifts for Valentine's Day, including about four and a half dollars per person spent on pets. I thought that was cool. $20 billion, or roughly twice the annual GDP, gross domestic product of Iceland, and more money $20 billion is more money than 60 countries in the United Nations gross domestic, domestic product for the entire year. Indeed, Americans make a really, really, really big deal about Valentine's Day. And it's all surrounding this perplexing, vexing, enigmatic issue that we call love. So I decided that I was going to talk a little bit about the Jewish perspective of love, maybe perhaps my own perspective, because I think, A, it's, it's, it's seasonal, it's the time of year, and uh, I think everyone agrees that this is an issue uh, where there's mass confusion. People don't know what love really is, or they think they know what it is, and they're actually mistaken, and I thought it would be, t it would be a good idea for me to tell you, my beloved listener, my beloved friend on Facebook, uh, what my opinion is on, on love and how do you get it? So, buckle down, buckle up, buckle up, settle down, and let's see what, let's see what we have to say. So, first thing I want to do is to define what love is and distinguish it from things which are often confused to be love and actually are not love. Turns out, like many things, there are lots of misconceptions that people have about love and, uh, and, and they're mistaken, um, for example, love versus lust. A lot of times when people say that they fell in love, what they really mean is that they fell in lust. A friend of mine, I was once in a bar with a friend of mine, and he sees the side profile of a girl. He says, oh, I'm in love with that girl. And then, when her full profile came into view, she says, oh, no, 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 <laughs> retracted it really quickly. Don't confuse love with lust. Lust is external. Lust is superficial. Lust is not real. Skin deep, if you will. Lust can also be when people um, get involved in long-term relationships for very superficial reasons. Uh, a friend of mine, unfortunately, is going through a... Uh, divorce, uh, and I asked him, I said, um, Tommy, why did you get married to her in the first place? So he told me, listen, he was, he's in the film industry, and oh, he tried to break into the film industry, and her dad, some, you know, producer, and he thought, well, you know, it would, it would help him if he would be associated. I said, that's really why you got married to that person? Really? Because her dad is a film producer? It turns out he didn't even get any, any status in, in that industry either. Sometimes people make long-term relationship decisions based on the silliest, silliest of things. I call that lust. But lust means the general category of identifying a person as a potential prospect for a long-term relationship based on very uh, simplistic, superficial, external things, not, uh, not things that are, um, that are demonstrative of how the person is uh, how the person really is. Love is a relationship that uh, where two people are connected in a very deep way, very profound way, um, in, in, in physically, emotionally, uh, even spiritually. 
while lust is very, very superficial and um, bound, bound to failure. If a relationship is based solely on lust, in all likelihood, they're not going to last more than uh, you know three to six months tops. Uh, relationships based on lust only are very, very fragile. So love is not lust. Don't confuse them. When people say they fell in love, they may in fact be meaning to say that they fell in lust, and it's important to distinguish between the two. So love is not lust. Love is not also infatuation. Infatuation is when the faculties of the mind get turned off. We've all had friends, I'm sure, that um, were engaging in harmful relationships. Um, and as, as friends, we try to talk them out of it and say, this is, this is not a good thing for you, this is bad. Uh, this is not a good person for you, this is not a quality person for you. And they, they seem hell-bent on, on, on developing a relationship with, with this person because, and you can't talk to them because they're, they're, they're blinded by infatuation. Love is a process that, we're, that if we're going to undertake uh, in acquiring it, we're going to need all of our uh, mental wits with us and to be properly alert and awake and enabled, enabled in order to be successful. Unfortunately, some people get blinded and they lose the ability to make uh, important decisions necessary uh, if they are to actually uh, build a relationship from the ground up. Uh, Rabbi Noah Weinberg of Blessed Memory once said, Infatuation is blind, love is a magnifying glass. When people engage or in a real deep relationship, all of their flaws come to the forefront. You better know what you got yourself into if you want to build a long-term relationship that's going to last. If you're infatuated, if you're blind, in all likelihood, you'll miss a lot of things that will come back to bite you in the future. It's important if we're going to engage in this roadmap, in this road towards love, to make sure that every, every bit of energy, every f fiber of our intellect is awake, is enabled, is alert, and is going to help us in this process. Okay, so we know what love is not. Love is not lust. Love is not superficial. Love is not infatuation. Uh, infatuation is the process of building a relationship uh, blindly. Love, you build a relationship very, very alertly, very awakely. Awakely, is that even a word? I don't even know. So what is love? We know, love, we know what love is not. What is love? So I define love as expansion of oneself to include someone beyond oneself. When you look at me, when you, when you think of, of, of yourself as an individual, you, your you encompasses other people. If I love someone, it means that me, when I think of me as an individual, I don't think of just me, physiological me. Rather, the person that I love is also part of me. Think of, of children. If, if you mess with my kid, you're messing with me. My dad always said, if you are friends with my son, you're friends with me. I don't know if he even knows this, but... What he's saying is that he feels such a strong identity with his son because he loves him, for obvious reasons, obviously, <laughs> um, uh, that if someone's friends with me, they're friends with my dad because my dad associates me as being part of him. That's the idea of love. We're expanding ourselves to include someone beyond ourselves. Parents is a great example. But if, if we want to love someone else, we're going to have to learn to expand ourselves to include that person as well. In Exodus 19, we have a very peculiar description of someone who's single. If you were to describe someone who's single, you would probably describe them as, uh, um, as alone, as perhaps uh, free, uh, as, I don't know, a bachelor. How would you describe someone who's single? If you take a look at Exodus 19, we describe a single person as someone who comes with the edge of his clothing. Big gapo in Hebrew, which means the edge of his clothing. Someone who comes with the edge of his clothing. Strange, odd, I would think. How, why would the Torah use such a strange description of someone who's single? So one of the commentators says that someone who's single, someone who doesn't have anyone that he loves, 
their life, their world ends, or their clothing ends. Who am I? I end right over here. If you want to love someone, you have to extend yourself. You have to expand yourself to include someone beyond oneself. It's a great story to illustrate this point. Uh, the late great uh, Rabbi Ari Levine of Jerusalem, blessed memory, uh, he uh, once famously went, uh, he had to go to the doctor, he had to take his wife to the doctor, he told the doctor, Doc, my wife's leg hurts us. Because he, he really took this lesson to heart. And to him, him and his wife, the love that they had uh, it made it that when his wife felt pain, he felt the same pain. Because he was them, he was her as well. That's what love really means. Expanding yourself to include someone beyond yourself. That's what love is. That's the structure of how love works. And herein also lies the challenge that we're, we're all going to face if we want to acquire love. Self-centeredness and selfishness. A narcissist cannot love because a narcissist only focuses on themselves. Self-centered, self-focused. If I care just about myself, my physiological self, I'm not going to be able to break away from that to include someone beyond, beyond myself. And from the day we're born, we, uh, we naturally uh, are selfish. A, a small baby cares only about themselves. A small child rarely wakes up in the middle of the night to tend to her crying mother. From, from the beginning of our lives, we're selfish. And if we are to love someone, we're going to have to undo all those years of living with ourselves, for ourselves, by ourselves, being selfish, being self-centered, and have to break that. And that's very painful. And that's the challenge that we're going to face if we are going to, to have love, to expand ourselves. So there are... Um, many, I uh, would say, barriers of entry or prices of admission that we're going to have to do in order to uh, prepare the groundwork of expanding ourselves to include someone beyond oneself. So, uh, we know what love is. Expansion of oneself to include someone beyond oneself. We know what love is not. It's not lust. It's not infatuation. So how do we get it? How do we get this love? So in Judaism, we say that the way to love someone is to see their virtues, to see the good things about them, and to identify them with those virtues. Everyone is composed of a mixture of good and bad characteristics or qualities. You know, people, some people are uh, don't get angry quickly. Some people get angry quickly. Uh, that's the, you, you know, some people have a short temper. Some people are patient. Some people are impatient. Some people have uh, are kind hearted. Some people are not. Everyone has a collection of good and bad characteristics. If you want to love someone, you have to focus on their good characteristics and learn to ignore, not focus on, not dwell upon their bad characteristics. Naturally, we tend to be the opposite. We tend that the we tend to be that the bad that someone does that jumps out at us, and we quickly label the person, we quickly identify the person as someone who's angry or impatient, etc. Uh, but the good is really hard to find. It's really much. You, know, you have to train yourself to learn to see the good in someone else. But if you want to love someone, you have to learn to see the good, focus on the good, uh, dwell on the good, and identify the person with the good. It's a great story brought down in the midrash where the rabbi is traveling with his students and they, they chance upon this uh, stinking carcass of a dead animal. And the students start kvetching and complaining, oh, how nasty, how terrible, how putrid. And the rabbi says, but look how white are its teeth. Look how white are its teeth. The lesson being is that we have to train ourselves, we have to train ourselves to always look for the good in other people. If we're going to learn to love other people, if we're going to learn this uh, to acquire this, this trait of, of, of love, we're going to have to look beyond the negative and focus on the positive. Now, does that mean that you have to go to your local federal, federal penitentiary and find the, the most gruesome rapist, axe murderer, serial killer, and arson, uh, arsonist and say, oh, you must have something good to you. I want to love you. No, does not mean that. We told you. You, you. you can't be infatuated. You can't be blind. You have to have your wits with you. You have to make important decisions when it comes to, to, to finding love. 
But every person has things about them that if you dwell upon them, it'll make you dislike them, resent them. Uh, it could be something as silly as uh, them not rolling up their socks or, or not unfurling their socks when they throw it into the uh, in, 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 into the hamper, or not covering the uh, not covering the toothpaste cap, or them not clearing out their hair from the bottom of the shower. Any one of these silly things in the world can unravel a relationship if people do not learn this important quality of focusing on the good, looking at the good, seeing the good, dwelling on the good, identifying the person with. The good and ignoring, ignoring those silly little things, those little bad characteristics that people invariably have. Look at beyond those. Indeed, love can be blind, but once you have the love, don't build a relationship blindly. But once you have a relationship, make sure that you you look past those silly misdeeds. So, we have to learn to see the good in other people, to focus, to try to, when you meet someone, you say, what does this person have that's worthy of admiration? What does this person have that I could learn from? What is good about this person, not what is bad about that person? That's how you love someone, by focusing on the good and identifying them with their virtues. Even if you have love, it's a well-documented fact that you could fall out of love just as easily as you fall in love. And it's, 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 it's rather unfortunate. There are so, so many people um, who, who have love or had love, and for some one reason or another, they lost it. <laughs> Um, so there's some people who have lo- had love or had love and they, and they lost it. So now we know how to have love, but tell us, Rabbi Walby, how do we maintain it? How do we sustain it? How do we make sure that we don't fall out of love like so many other people in the world do? So, uh, quick joke, what's the difference between love and herpes? Herpes lasts forever. Unfortunately, love does not always last forever. And I like to compare this to a treadmill. Love is like a treadmill. If you want to make sure that you're not flying backwards, you have to constantly work to progress it. We have to constantly take steps to ensure, to deepen our relationship. Take step or, or uh, practice in love building exercises that, gave, that, brought us love, that brought us love to begin with. If you don't want to fall out of love, make sure you're constantly falling in, in love uh, again and again. You can fall out of love very, very easily, and it's very unfortunate when it happens. So uh, make sure you, once you have your love, you don't lose it. Um, so I want to I give a quick recap um, by saying, um, I had this question recently, um, why, why uh, it sounds so difficult and so unappealing and unexciting, uh, what you described to us, Rabbi. Um, why should we have love to begin with? Um, and the answer to that is that love is a tremendous pleasure, um, a tremendous pleasure that's greater than anything money could buy. We know, we all know that money can't buy me love, but the pleasure that you could have of love, the pleasure of expansion of oneself to include someone beyond oneself, the pleasure of breaking away from our self-centeredness is so great that it's greater than anything money could buy. And I'll, I'll prove that to you by uh, asking your parent if they'll trade you or they'll sell you for any amount of money in the world, hundreds, millions, bazillion, bazillion dollars. You could buy anything in the world. Any parent, or most parents, healthy parents will say, I am not trading my child for no amount of money in the world. Why? Because children whom we naturally love, that pleasure of love brings us more, gives us more than anything money so could buy. So this year, when you spend your share of the $20 billion Americans spend on Valentine's Day, on gifts, chocolate, berries, Vermont teddy bears, you'll know what love is really all about.